Welcome to tonight's Merrill series. Um, we have just a terrific mix of attendees among us, alum from all eras of our wonderful school, alum parents, current parents, I think a few students um, in the mix, as well as trustees and other members of our community. If I haven't met you, I look forward to the opportunity beyond the Zoom screen. Um, we have one of the things I've experienced um, getting to know alum and our community um, from all eras is that we are wonderful conversationalists and love to, to talk. And tonight's program will be both about the art of conversation and storytelling, as well as will allow for conversation and storytelling. Um, to facilitate that, a few Zoom housekeeping matters. Um, one, we would love it if you rename yourself so we can know who's among us. Um, and if possible, um, we hope you'll turn on your video. Um, no judgment, um, messy hair allowed. Um, and we will, as I said, have plenty of time for questions um, in the last third of our time together. Um, you can at any moment submit a question in the Q&A window, um, and when our moderator opens up the floor, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can ask your question or share your comment. Um, tonight, we are very grateful to be joined by Diantha Parker, class of 1990, and she's currently a story editor at Marketplace and an audio consultant. Um, previously, she's worked at the New York Times, NPR, WBEZ Chicago, and elsewhere as a reporter, producer, editor, and host. Um, our moderator will tell you even more about Diantha and her background, and we are delighted to be welcoming back David Kravitz, class of 82, um, to um, move our conversation along. Um, David and I were at Commonwealth um, at the same time, um, but we are no longer pipsqueaks um, as we were then. <laughs> David is Deputy State Solicitor in the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office and has also had an illustrious career as an opera and concert singer, appearing with the Boston Symphony Orchestra, Washington National Opera, Emmanuel Music, and many others. Uh, David, like so many among our Commonwealth community, is a polymath uh, and a Renaissance person. So with that, David, I very gratefully turn it over to you and Diantha. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. It's wonderful to see you here. And thank you to everybody on the Zoom. It is uh, just absolutely fantastic to see uh, such a great turnout uh, for this event. Uh, I am I am really excited about this one, not only because uh, I think it's a great topic, um, and Diantha is a, a fantastic, had a fantastically interesting career, and, and, and I'm really looking forward to talking about it. I also have to mention that, that Diantha uh, and I overlapped at Commonwealth in my brief stint as a faculty member. Diantha was a student, and so um, so it, it's great uh, to be together again um, here uh, it, with all of you to sort of talk about uh, uh, talk about storytelling in this age and and sort of what your role in that has been. And so I, I just want to start. Um, uh, really, without any further ado, by asking uh, by asking you, Diantha, to uh, just sort of give us a more detailed tour through where you have worked, what you have done, and 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 and, 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 and how sort of what you've done has changed um, over over your time uh, working in in the media. Um, well, hello, everybody, um, and it is very fun to see people's names pop up and people I overlapped with, people I know only by reputation because they were like older kids um, and all that. And as David said, um, you know, we go way back. And um, just to thank everybody at Commonwealth for inviting me and having me do this. It's really, it's really great. And David and I have talked a little bit about this in the past um, and have done these other events. And I certainly never imagined that um, we would be doing it in this like Jetsons like way, um, which I was sort of thinking about as I was thinking about storytelling and narrative and all that. Um, briefly, um, as Jennifer so kindly said, I have worked at 
several major news organizations um, over the past like more than 25 years now. Um, and I've spent most of my career in audio, um, which we used to only call radio, but now it's called audio uh, to encompass both stuff that is aired and broadcast and also stuff that is also referred to as on demand or podcasting. Um, so I started out at NPR actually um, after a brief stint in magazines because I really wanted to be a magazine editor. Um, my mother who is here this evening also was a magazine editor and I was very, very taken with the format. Um, so I started there. I was a producer at NPR for a long time. I was a freelance radio person for a long time. I've been what's called a showrunner. Um, I helped start Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me uh, and was the director of that show for five years. And I also worked at All Things Considered as a producer. And after NPR, um, I was a reporter at WBEZ in Chicago, which is the Chicago affiliate, um, which you has a great newsroom, which I was privileged to kind of learn to be a reporter in, but also This American Life is from there and many other great programs. And then after a while, I was freelancing here in New York. I have been in an independent one woman podcast making shop, um, you know, producing, hosting, um, writing for people, training people in audio. I was on the faculty at Columbia Journalism School for a long time in the audio department, teaching writing for the ear, which we're gonna talk about. Um, and then I was also working at the New York Times as an editor on various desks, the national and the foreign and the business desk. Um, and now I'm an editor at Marketplace where I was a reporter way back like 15 years ago on contract from Chicago. And I now help other reporters tell their stories. Um, and I also edit what's called long form, um, some of the podcasts that the marketplace does. And it's been, uh, and we and we talk mostly about um, business and the economy, which is like not anything that a Commonwealth I would have thought that I would spend my time writing about. <laughs> so, um it's 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 really a, it's a remarkable sort of span of things that you have that you have done um, in in the media world and and I guess largely uh, as as it happens kind of in the in the public in the public radio ish sphere although I guess I mean also for some like really major legacy organizations like New York Times um, so I guess one thing one of the things I'm curious about is that you you've, you've um, a lot of the different places that you've worked, um, you, you've been telling a particular kind of story to a particular kind of audience. And, and that has shifted, I think, quite a bit over the years in the different places that you've worked in, the different media that you've worked in. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, about what you found to be in common with all of those things, if, if there is anything? And, and, then, and then what has been like completely different when you've moved from like point A to point B? Yeah, um, I think, you know, first of all, um, landing at National Public Radio in the mid 90s um, without a lot, with some experience in radio, but like kind of knowing it as a listener um, and not really understanding how it was put together. What I felt there and what I think has continued and what is a common thread through everything is just the the idea of like, one single person is telling a story and the audience is one person. Like the storyteller is one person or the, you know, the, the, the writer or the, the main character, you know, is one person um, and the audience is one person. And the sense that you basically just are doing this very human thing where you have an idea and you have a story and you're just gonna unspool it. And, there's a sense, I think back then too, that there was, depending on where you were telling the story as well as who you were telling it to, that there was a heightened formality, right? About like, this is a serious news organization or like, this is a serious news story and we are gonna tell it in a serious way. And this is like very sad or important. Um, and that there was some room for personality and like funniness, um, but that generally every place kind of had a sound. And I mean, think, I think everybody here, is familiar with the public radio sound, um, which is like kind of now evolving, but is sort of a, you know, a now one, basically a 45 year old um, sense of like, 
you got some sound, you have a host who tells you what's going on, then you've got this reporter who's maybe on the scene, then you're maybe in a studio and then you say goodbye and it's like four minutes <laughs> or something like that. Um, and it's widely parodied, um, you know, often imitated kind of thing. Um, and then when you get to a place, you know, that's sort of true throughout the, the system. And that's migrated, I think, to podcasting as well, that there's a, there's a certain sort of intimate single person's voice telling you something. Then you have a place like the New York Times, which was like also, I mean, in the middle of my career going there, I'd never worked for a newspaper before. I know that sounds kind of nutty to be like, oh, I just ended up there. I did not just end up there. I tried to work there for like 10 years. Um, and I finally, you know, did manage to get in and it was a way of really broadening, like, I cannot just do this forever. I want to tell stories in a different way. The Times at that time was, you know, trying to figure out how do they broaden their audience? And they were actually very interested in what, you know, I as a radio person or as an audio person knew um, and other people like me who had training like mine, who did not come up through local newspapers um, had to say about like, this is a 100, this, news organization goes back to 1851. Um, and sometimes it even looks a little bit like it did back then. And now it lives online and it has different media. And what does it look like? And what does it sound like? And also who is the audience? It is not the same audience that got the paper on their breakfast table every morning. It's, you know, people all over the world, for example, it's not just a American or even a local New York paper. Um, and they're people of different ages and people whose English is, you know, not their first language uh, and maybe isn't, maybe isn't even a language they speak. So I would say that those are two big common, you know, there's big commonalities there about how do we tell a story so it feels intimate and direct. And then also like the two audiences seem wildly different and yet there's a place that they want to converge. It is the goal sort of to, to have the listener feel as though the storyteller is speaking directly to you, directly to the listener. Like, like, like it's really just like we're sitting across the table, like you and I are sitting here like this. It, yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, that's, I think the way to, I think, I think that's what you have to connect with. Like you can't sit in a, for example, you can't write a radio script um, or an audio script without kind of saying it aloud, which is also, you know, I want to talk about, I, one of the things I really want to talk about, which we discussed is like, the craft of this, like how you do it. Um, because I think that is both the same in many cases, and then there's like some stark differences, but you really have to think about not, oh, I'm speaking to an audience of 7 million people who turn us on at breakfast time or who downloaded this podcast, but to like one single person. Um, and often with a complicated topic, it's like, how would you tell this to a room full of fidgety fifth graders? You know, how would you explain the Federal Reserve to, you know, an 11 year old who wants to do something else um, or, um, you know, your mom um, who is like, oh, what do you do? That's interesting. But like, isn't really that interested, like doesn't really have a lot of time, because mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's the thing is that you want to kind of get people um, uh, who don't think that they that this story is for them. And then within a few words or a sentence you've hooked them like that's the goal um and that to me is you know as i said to you um and i've said before like i draw a very straight line from understanding how to read um and fall in love with words at commonwealth um and even before commonwealth to you know how to write effectively and how to communicate a complicated idea effectively um, in a way that I feel like people can can absorb and respond to. Um, I, I, I have no doubt that that uh, the Commonwealth faculty will be delighted to uh, to hear that. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. that bone out um, there. So so you mentioned you mentioned the craft um, yeah. and, and that you wanted to talk about it and and, and let's 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 do that. Um, let's let's actually just sort of turn uh, if you like to <clears throat> to what you know, what are just like, you know, how, how would you explain to, you know, a, a sort of a general audience, which is kind of what you're talking to right now, how would you explain kind of the, the high points of, of, of the craft of storytelling? And I, and I, and I personally am, am particularly interested also in like, 
when you were working at the Times and trying to help bring this organization that was used to writing in, in a very particular way and for a very particular audience and, and having to, uh, I would imagine, completely change in some ways what it is that they are doing and how they're writing. Like, what did you have to, you know, explain to these folks? Um, yeah, and I should say, like, you know, I was not the only person, you know, sort of trying trying to affect this change. But, um, you know, one thing I would say is that, um, you know, starting with with audio, first of all, I just want to say about storytelling. Um, I had a, a boss at NPR who I once heard say, like, somebody was saying, like, oh, there's this storytelling, you know, uh, conference in Nashville. Like, I really think we should do a piece from there. And she went like this. She went, storytelling. I don't like that word. Don't say it. She was like, corn cob pipes, straw hats. Like, I don't want it. And, and I kind of think of that sometimes, like when I think of storytelling and, you know, now people talk about narrative, which I also have problems with, but right. We're talking about, you know, being a narrator um, or explaining, you know, spooling something out for people. So anyway, I'm fine with storytelling, but I do, you know, I can never get that out of my head. And so now I've put it in all of your heads and that's a story that I've, that I've told. Um, but I think that the, the, the nut of it is that when you are in audio, which I feel like I had the great fortune to move kind of from like college writing to this, just be confronted with this very, very different sort of writing, which is very compressed, um, much like the, you know, very much like the spoken word, like there is not, there is, I would say elegance to it, but it's like, it's a very, it's writing in a certain kind of vernacular. Um, like you are performing as if you are just telling a story, like I'm just unspooling it now, like I don't even have a script, but the idea is to sort of sound a little bit like you don't have a script and you write in a very compressed way. And so if you have like four minutes and you want to talk to three or four people, that's sort of a, a minute per idea. And you can't, it's very hard to kind of cram more of that. So it's like you introduce an idea, then you introduce a person who is going to talk about that idea that's another sentence. That's like you've maybe, maybe you're three sentences in, then you have like a cut of tape from that person, which is, you know, not more than 25 seconds long. This is telling something in a very compressed way. And then you have to get out of that piece of tape and then you have to, you know, but that idea this, and then you go to the next idea. So by the time, you know, you can spend like five minutes just being like, there's this great story I want to tell you about the Federal Reserve. And like, first, let's talk about what the Federal Reserve is back in whatever. And, you know, then then it's like you're done. It's like the story's over, like you don't have time. So there's this sense that you get, you know, when I was teaching this, I talked a lot about, OK, you have a big idea or you've spent all day somewhere. Like, how do you compress it <laughs> or how do it? Why is that just like one minute of your four minute story or what maybe it's only like five minutes of your 25 minute podcast episode you know or maybe it's just a it's just a blip or maybe you spent like weeks somewhere gathering tape and like the audience only hears this very compressed version and it has to do with this sense of you know if you if you had like you know five or ten stories from a day out reporting you know, and you put us, you stack them up and you put a spike through it. Like where does, does the spike have to touch a certain part of every story? And that that's kind of the skeleton of your, of your narrative. Um, so it's like, what little stories make up your big story and how do you tell them, you know, in a, in a kind of compressed way. And I keep using this word compressed, which makes it seem like you're trying to squeeze a lot into a little, but actually it's, there's a sense of expansion you know, um, and that's what the writing is about, is like, how do you, in three sentences, you know, get somebody from, I'm introducing this idea to here's a person who's going to illustrate it or say more about it. And I mean, that's the great thing about tape, right, is that tape helps you tell the story. And it's all about what tape do you have? And, um, and how do you kind of, how do you support that? Um, so you, um, uh, there's a lot to unpack in there, and I there's I, a lot. I know I'm, I wrote kinda, a little note just, to myself. It's just that's like, like we had this wonderful this. like hour and a half conversation yeah. last well, week. Well, yeah, and you know, we don't, we don't um, have, and, and we just don't have time to get into it all. But there's a couple things I want to hit. 
um, uh, in what you just talked about. One is um, you mentioned that you're now doing some work in, in long form, mm -hmm. which I take to mean um, either a single sort of longer story or, or even like a multi, you know, if you get into the sort of the podcasting world, um, like, you know, I'm sure a lot of people listen to Serial. I know I did. There are other like multi-episode mm -hmm. uh, uh, multi uh, podcasts that where you're really talking a very, very long form uh, situation where you're expecting the reader to listen to, you know, literally hours of, of tape. Um, I don't know if this is even a question that makes sense, but like, is 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 the long form just like kind of a broadened version of of the four minute, or is there or is there other stuff that that you know you need, really need to pay attention to if you're going to to tell try to tell a longer story? Um, I would say two. I would say two things. Um, first, I want to just quickly to answer this. I want to just quickly touch back on something that you said, which we could we could come back to, which is that like. For example, at the times, um, as you were saying, like about we were, you touched a little bit in your question about you know the changing um, sort of style of writing, which hasn't changed that much, but just the even the idea of it, it was the sense of you know if you are planning to like have somebody spend you know four thousand words worth of time with you, um, you know you can take longer. Um, both in your sentences, you know, because somebody is reading it and also in your kind of like added detail and everything, you can kind of pad it out so that you can tell the story, you can spool it out in a much, um, in a much longer way. Um, and I think the trick with long form is, you know, you don't want to suddenly go back, like I'm writing a, you know, 4,000 word, like front page story for the times. Like right. you have to kind of keep that sense of compressed language, shortened sentences. Like I told my students to talk about Hemingway, to think of Hemingway um, and also E.B. White, um, who is one of my favorite authors. And I said, I would say like, go back and get a copy of Charlotte's Web and read it aloud because that is why it was written. It was written, it is a chapter book. It is not a four minute story. It is a chapter book that is meant to be read aloud and the sentences are short. And it has a it has a poetry and a rhythm to it that is about human speech, um, and everybody like assiduously writes it down. It's very gratifying, um, but it is really great, um, you know, in many ways. And because it shows you that you know this is a talented essayist who could like who wrote for the New Yorker and you know all whatever. But in this format, he knew that that was not his audience, and so you have to think like if you are trying to attract somebody and have them with you for 20 minutes, you have to speak to them. It can't just be like they're listening to a stentorian, you know, person like read an essay and it's gonna go on for a long time. You have to figure out where the story starts, which is often not at the beginning. And usually it just starts with an emotion, right? Like you have to make somebody feel something right at the beginning. And then you have, then you've bought some time with them that you can kind of, Put in what I call the vegetables, um, which is like the who, what, when, where, why kind of thing of like, why are we telling this story? Like sometimes you can unspool that in the emotional part, but not always. And, you know, if you're going to write that kind of thing really compellingly and realistically, then it has to kind of be like really like one person kind of telling it to another. Um, and often that happens with tape um, where you just say, like, can you just tell me what happened? and you have somebody in their own words describe something that happened to them. Um, and sometimes you have to be like, can you start at this particular point? Like, tell me what you were feeling. And then you kind of figure out where they open from. And sometimes it's about, you know, walking someone up who is listening to this really, really emotional point and then taking them back, you back out of that moment. And you do that in the writing. Like, you don't say like, oh my God, you know, somebody, somebody got shot in this story, but it's not going to happen until like 20 minutes into the 25. Like you cannot do that. Right. It's like Chekhov, like the gun has to appear at the beginning and then it's gonna, you know, you're going to see it at the end. So, so I think, I think that to me is like the, the biggest thing of you have to give away something at the top mm -hmm. um, 
of what you're going to spool out. And then you have to remind people, depending on how long you are going on, you have to remind people in audio, it's called signposting. Like, hey, remember, you know, we met that guy, you know, who was at the gas station. Well, again, you know, or you're going to be like, now remember, so-and-so worked at the State Department. <laughs> I mean, that's a very like vernacular way of doing it, but it, it, it often takes that form. So you remind people um, as you go along, kind of what we've, you know, where we are in our story. <laughs> right. Um, like, like a, 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 I suppose a, a 4,000 word New York Times article, you can just sort of flip back if you don't remember yeah, who, yeah. who the person brown. is. Brown, you're like, who's Brown? Like a <laughs> doctor who was mentioned like, you know, 30 pages, like whatever, before the jump, you know, right? right. Like, just like, right. wait, who's that guy? Yeah, you can't, you can't do that. Um, I mean, one thing that I think also is really great about audio that helped me very much and in at Columbia and, you know, teaching writing, a lot of people would walk into an audio class and they were like, I'm just taking this for fun. Like, I'm really going to be a magazine writer. And, you know, they were often kind of snotty about broadcast, um, that there was sort of a town and gown um, aspect to it. Um, and then all, a lot of those people ended up being like audio concentrators. And it was because they realized that like the way that they learned to write was going to help them in no matter what form of media they were going to get to. And this was very germane to the times too, because when I got there in 2012, um, they were starting to realize that they were, you know, polling the audience and stuff and more people had smartphones. And it was clear that, you know, maybe 20% of the audience was first interacting. I was gonna have my phone here as a prop and I don't have it. So I'm just gonna hold up my hand. Um, but they were you know, interacting with the stuff on the phone first. And then they would maybe go to their desktop and like look at the slideshow. And then by 2015, that had moved to 60%. So 60% of the audience is like getting up and like going like in the morning and like holding up their phone over their face. And they are often not ever going to a desktop. So they realized that they had to switch the whole way that they, you know, they developed a mobile homepage and they also started writing sentences, you know, in a shorter way because they have to appear on the phone. You can't just like mm -hmm. be reading this like long, like, you know, lead, um, you know, in this town of 20,000, uh, you know, blah, 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 like semicolon, like it doesn't work, right? And you're going to lose people and people can't read it. So they realized that they had to both, there was a craft element and then there was also this much more personal voice, which is everywhere, which people were expecting. And I think that's a big thing that's changed too. And so even, even now, if you buy a print version of the New York Times, do you think that that has sort of, you know, like reverse engineered its way into the writing for print or do they still? Yeah, I do. I think there's a few things that have changed. First of all, um, you know, there's a lot of younger people who are like digital natives who are writing. I mean, that's been true for a long time, but it just is like, you know, people who are younger than me, much younger than me. Um, and they have a lot more young people like writing. Um, they also have people who did not grow up reading the Times, writing for the Times, which I think is key. And that is also true of audio that people who didn't grow up with like all things considered in the car is like, those are the people who, who need to be telling the stories and who are telling the stories now. I also, I was thinking about this today, um, you know, about Commonwealth too. Young people, like people who are just starting out now in their careers um, are, have just much more access to a lot more first person and just personal writing. They just do like memoir exploded, you know, kind of starting in the 90s, like the idea that if you were not a famous person, you could still tell a personal story and have it published or have it be out there. You know, there's a style about it. There's a kind of every man, every woman, every like, you know, they aspect about it that like a personal story is valuable and telling it in a direct and intimate way on a blog or like Instagram or whatever, TikTok, like people are absorbing these stories. And, you know, big news organizations have to follow that. Um, and I think that, you know, everything from like the way that this writing style has changed a little bit, you know, the way that there's amazing interactives that people are, you know, it turned into, it was, it was a newspaper that had a website and now it's a 24 or hour or news organization that puts out a newspaper, you know, for the time being. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's going to happen, you know, the, but 
you know, that's a really big shift and that's a battleship to turn. And there were people who were just like, you know, realistically were like, I've been writing a certain way. Like, do you have the temerity to like, tell me that you know something about like newspaper writing person who's never written for a newspaper, except for like, you know, light earth earthquake hits Kentucky, you know, which is headline that I, my first headline anyway, but, but like, you know, just like, what do I know? Right. To them. Um, but what I think happened is that people realized that they enjoyed it. So they got good feedback on it. People are reading the stories and then they're like, oh, actually this feels better. I feel like I'm actually communicating, you know, and the communication goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and then uh, I, I'm mindful of our time, but one thing I really want to touch on um, is uh, you worked for quite a while at WBEZ as, as a reporter and you've mm -hmm. reported a lot of really interesting stuff and kind of, uh, uh, and, and, you know, uh, pretty daring stuff in some ways. And, um, and you were a producer first. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious to know um, how, Having been a producer, how did that affect your reporting and the way you were, the way you approached reporting stories? And then I just wonder if you can remember a particular story that was that you can give us an example of what you said about like leading a story with an emotion and trying to generate emotion in your in your uh, in your listeners. Um, so I was a um, I did a bunch of things. I mean, I was a general assignment reporter, but um, I basically just, I was based in the news, I was based at WBEZ because of Wait, Wait, and I just really wanted to start to do stories. Um, I um, I had been traded back to All Things Considered, um, and it, like, a day before 9-11, um, like, like, September 10th or something, and then it was like, you know, we were sort of back in this, you know, once-in-a-lifetime, you know, world news event, and um, when I got back, I just was like, I have been producing reporter stories, like taking the script, taking the tape, taking the elements, you know, coaching people through their reads, like putting the elements together. Um, so I kind of know what works and what doesn't work. So when I started reporting, they actually had no criminal justice reporter, which was something that really interested me. And I just started, I had started covering the police department and I had made connections there. And I started to cover, you know, criminal, a criminal justice beat in Chicago is like, you know, in this particular case was the police department and the very long standing, um, very long standing allegations of torture by white um, cops of black suspects in custody. Um, and this is a story with a, you know, this is like a 40 year old story that was kind of broken open in the nineties. You know, I did a lot of work on it, a lot of work on wrongful convictions. And I was saying to David earlier that you know, it was a small newsroom um, and I would show up and I was often, you know, the only per person who was not a person of color in the room. And I found myself telling a lot of stories where like I was a white reporter, you know, from a kind of like perceived, um, you know, politically sympathetic news organization and kind of how to navigate that. Um, and these are really emotional stories and like often very traumatic um, and intense. <laughs> Um, and, you know, you really kind of don't need to ham it up at all. In fact, what I feel like that sort of storytelling taught me was to be like, I can be myself, but it's really about letting other people shine um, and letting other people talk and figuring out how to get people in a short amount of time. Um, it often takes a long time to kind of explain, you know, why this matters outside of, you know, an incident that happened 30 years ago that, you know, the case, whatever, it's been admitted and it's over and people have to get over it. So, um, you know, a lot of it was, um, you know, I mean, opening with um, like a piece of testimony, you know, from somebody. Um, I feel like this got really dark all of a sudden. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to not, but I mean, this this really was, this really was like, a huge test of me as a reporter to be like, this isn't, you know, this can't be about me, like, you know, in the city, like telling the story. It has to really be about, you know, how can I be kind of neutral, but also allow the tape to shine. Um, 
I'm trying to think of like, you know, in terms of an emotion, you know, one story I did that I really enjoyed um, was this story. It was like the end, it was a, it was a, and I don't want to take up too much time with this, but it's like debtor's court, like people who owe a lot of money on their credit cards. And there's like a little sad courtroom, um, you know, where somebody comes and hears the case and it's like, okay, you owe all this stuff to T-Mobile. And like, there's people there who will help them like pay the debt or get some of it sold off or whatever. And I spoke to the ju this judge and this is like all he does. He's like about to retire at this point. And he was like, he said like, you know, this is a very emotional thing for people and people want to have their day in court and I'm here to give it to them. And so I'm here to let them be emotional. And if you come today, you're going to see that. And he's like, and you want to greet people and be polite to them. And there was just something about like his personality. You know, often people say you have a character. Characters in stories are often interchangeable. The story is what matters. The story was like the story of this court where people were getting their debt thrown out. But the character of this judge, you know, was very compelling. And I felt kind of like he also had some emotion about it. And I felt like being able to just transmit that right at the top of the story to be like, feels, you know, these people are not deadbeats. These people are parents and, you know, they're not like trying to escape. They're just in a bad situation. And there's something about putting that up there first that I felt like set the rest of the story up. Yeah. That's great. Um, in in just a minute or two before we open it up to questions, I do want to like shift gears a little bit and and, and talk about um, not just uh, uh, how you tell a story, but what story do you decide to tell? Um, and and you know, obviously it, it, the the decision, the decisions that are made about what stories are told and who tells them, uh, that is going to have an enormous impact on, on the people who consume this media because they can only hear the stories that, that, that the media organizations decide to tell them. And so I wonder if you can talk just uh, a little bit, I'm sure we could talk a lot, but, uh, but we'll try to talk just a little bit about, um, about sort of how those decisions are made and, and if that has changed if the way those decisions are made has changed uh, in, in the years that you've been in this business? Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, first of all, certainly in the last like four years, um, at five years, like, you know, before the pandemic and also after, you know, the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all these, you know, all of these people that have kind of, shown that these individual stories have far, far, far greater meaning and ramifications. I think, you know, this, this is interesting for our newsroom because, you know, there's stories of like the economy, marketplace is like, well, we are the, you know, show and podcast about business and the economy. And it's like, you cannot talk about business and the economy without talking about the massive in America, you know, without talking about the massive inequalities that have existed for, you know, as long as this, you know, country has existed in its present form um, and, and what led to that. And so that, I think, for example, in a financial newsroom, um, you know, there was a real reckoning there of like, you know, whose stories, we're not just telling the stories of rich people and we're not just telling the stories of like, oh, those poor people in that poor situation who don't make a lot of money and let's do a story about food stamps. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm being somewhat lighthearted and facetious here, but I do think that like figuring out how, you know, the voices are different and also from what perspective is different um, was really important and understanding that the audience was changing um, that it was not just people in their Volvos, you know, driving home, um, like a largely white audience over 45. Like it was like young men of color, like finding a podcast on the phone and being like, oh, hey, this is cool. Like I'm interested in investing. Like I want to, I mean, people wrote in. So we know who these people are actually like en masse um, to be like, I'm interested in finding out more about this or just, you know, you can see what the metrics are. And yeah, like as, as, um, newsrooms, you know, become, first of all, off, often largely remote. So you can hire people wherever they are. You can tell stories from wherever. Um, that, you know, you don't have to have the means to like move to New York to work in a certain newsroom or whatever to tell a certain story. Um, and I think it's sort of 
that I think has democratized hiring to some extent. And that trickles down to who, who is, you know, assigned a story, but also who, who assigns a story um, that you can, you know, you don't have to have people who are based in one geographic location who then kind of make all these decisions from say, you know, Washington DC or even LA, you know, that it's much more egalitarian, I think that way. Um, and, you know, I think as somebody who manages reporters and hires them and also edits stories and, you know, vet stories, um, I think it's important to figure out like these stories are not for people who look like me or have my background. So while I can facilitate, you know, I have to, I have to separate myself. It's not just what I find interesting, you know? Um, and I think we have to, you kind of, there's all this talk now about unconscious bias, which we all have about like, you gravitate towards certain topics or people. And so that's, that to me is like, we're starting to break that down, that there are different people making different kinds of decisions in newsrooms and that that will continue to evolve. And I'm saying newsrooms, but I also mean about like what's available. Um, and also people can make stuff now and distribute it in a way that they could not like when we were starting out. You know, the bar to entry is low. I would say the bar to success about your storytelling and your narrative is very high. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the reason why there aren't a hundred serials is because like there's only one serial podcast and it's serial. You know, uh, and um, and you people are like, we're gonna have the next serial. Uh, you know, only serial is serial, and you can make things that are great. Um, but the sense that everybody can sort of take a model and tell their own story, I think, is you know where it's at now. That seems like a great place to pause, and um, I will throw it to Morgan for a second to see uh, if we have some questions from our. Um, audience here. Yes, um, we, we have one question in chat and I'll encourage folks to send more through the Q&A or raise your hand and I'll uh, unmute you. But our first question is, uh, when you do interviews for those four minute stories, what's the ratio of time for the interview to how much makes it onto the air? And how do you coax your interviewee to speak to the point eloquently? Um. First of all, hi, Mr. Robinson. Um, <laughs> it's great to see you. Um, and thank you for your question. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I um, have often struggled with, but basically for a, a very short story, um, if you're only gonna talk to somebody, uh, you know, and you're only gonna use a, you know, a couple, a couple of minutes, I would say that's generous. Um, you kind of have to, you prep them and you're like, this is for a short story. It's only going to be this long. Um, we're going to talk. I mean, if you talk for more than 10 minutes, you're setting yourself up for sadness in terms mm -hmm. of trying to get the tape. Um, often, I would say, you know, you when you're writing a story like that, and depending on how tight your deadline is, um, you often know what you kind of need that particular source to say. Like, if you are talking, you know, to the education professor, you'll have one thing, whereas if you're talking to the teacher, you'll have something else. And then if you have, you know, you kind of, you kind of cast the story in some ways, um, sort of like what I said about characters earlier, like sometimes characters are interchangeable. Um, like if somebody's like, oh my God, I wanted to do this, but I dropped out or I decided I don't want to, you're like, well, now I need another purple haired economist who can talk about the fit or whatever. So, you know, you do kind of learn in this business of like how to kind of swap people in and out. Um, but unless you have a, if you have a central theme that you need the person to speak to, you're gonna, you're kind of kind of walk them up to it in the question. And, and often people are used to doing that and they'll say, oh, you want a sound bite? And I'm like, that's exactly what I do not want. I want you to tell me <laughs> um, this uh, in, in a, you know, and, and often you can say like, hey, can you say that? Um, again and start at the place you know where you like stopped you stopped the lead up and just got right to the point um and they're often very like happy to do that so it's sort of a you know it, I think it depends on the reporter but generally it's it's a it's a short interview thanks our next question um what are your thoughts 
on how new AI technology will affect and shape storytelling and storytellers? Oh, yes, I have many thoughts. Um, and hello, hello, Jamie. Um, yeah, I have many thoughts. It is already shaping it, and it's been shaping it. Um, and, you know, this is, I think some people see it as kind of an opera. I mean, I think it's so, sort of scary because, um, you know, it's, it's responsive and it's going to continue to evolve. Um, some newsrooms are already using AI um, and they're definite, I mean, and they're open about it and some are kind of less open. Um, I mean, I think the thing about AI, um, like, you know, chat GPT or something like that is that it learns from what you tell it. Um, and this is very simplistic and I'm sure there's tech people here who can explain this better than I can, um, or will correct me. But I think, you know, for me, it's like you teach the AI, you know, what the kind of thing you want to write. And then it kind of, you know, learns from you and starts to learn, you know, and starts to sort of scarily sound, sort of adapt your voice. And I think it's just going to be a function of, you know, something that, that we live with now it's in newsrooms, it's in, you know, schools and universities. It's like anywhere where the written word is, um, it's going to be an increasing factor. And I think we're just kind of getting our arms around that. All right, and I see we have a, a hand raised, so I'm gonna um, invite Lorena to, to unmute it and share. Thank you, Morgan. Um, thank you so much, uh, Diantha, for doing this. Um, my name is Lorena, I'm a teacher, I'm a Montessori teacher. I teach uh, elementary school students and I also teach middle school students. It's part of the program, three year. Uh, uh, I teach basically fourth, fifth and sixth graders. And I found that it was very helpful, your tips that you were referring to, for example, some of them felt like Commonwealth very much, like <laughs> writing shorter sentences, um, Hemingway for sure. And I appreciated what you mentioned about the signposts because I do find that I do naturally tend to do that when I'm reading a story to them. Is there, a, have you noticed, or are you able to speak to how kid podcasts are done versus adult podcast like what is what are some good tips for specific to that age range oh that's a great question um and i would point you i have like direct experience really with only one kids podcast um which is part of the marketplace um stable of podcasts which is called million bazillion um, which explains, you know, economic economic ideas and ideas about finances to, to kids. I mean, I think with that, it's it really is about tone and the feeling like you really have to, you know, depending on the age range, like the kids need to feel like you're talking to them. Um, and there's also a lot of, there's a sense, um, and this is sort of true of, I think, podcasts for adults as well, but there needs to be a way that it doesn't feel like they're listening in on something and they're not involved. You know, I've often like listened to a uh, three people in a chat, you know, podcast talking and you don't feel like you're at the table. Like you feel like they're the cool kids kind of, and you're not, you know, involved or like, they're not really thinking about an audience. Like when people say like, Oh, just have it be a fly on the wall. It's like, no, you actually want to feel like you are, not the fly like you want to feel like you are kind of a silent member of the of the group or that you could kind of burst in and i think that like million bazillion they have a lot of they have some skits they have you know back and forth between the hosts they ask questions kind of sort of open-ended questions of the audience and i think it's all about like making kids feel like they're involved and then it and because kids are so used to being like you're gonna listen now i mean there's a lot of that and if there's this sense that it's like an active listening, like they can really think about something or you give them something like write this down or, you know, something where they, you feel, they feel like they're being interacted with, um, I think all makes a lot of sense. But Million Bazillion is fun in that, in that way. All right, our next question comes from Sarah Brownsberger, class of 76. She asks, can you talk about the use of background music in reporting? Once podcasts are on NPR, the techniques start blending and that makes the ethics fuzzy. To my ear, music introduces bias. 
I was shocked on moving back to the States after 10 years away by the degree to which even public media had moved toward infotainment. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I know what you're saying, um, Sarah, like I, and I feel like it sort of depends on like where you're listening and, and what you're listening to. And I think in the podcast, let's say like nonfiction universe, um, you know, music and scoring is much more prevalent. And I feel like these things are often, even if it is journalism, it's kind of journalism adjacent, um, where it's like nonfiction, but not strictly like a news report. And I will say that in, you know, news reports, like, let's say all things considered or marketplace, um, if you're in a news story, you do not, there's, I mean, the, the, um, convention is to never use music in those. There is bridging music that comes in and out of stories. And I think that too needs to be like carefully edited because that can also introduce um, you know, like a, an idea, um, like not just sad music after something that you think is supposed to be sad, but um, like, for example, like there was once a really big uproar uh, at NPR because there was a piece about politics in India and there was Bangladeshi music that was played out of it just because like the director was like, oh yeah, this sounds good. And it was like, mm, no, like world music is very editorial, like so-called world music, um, like music from places other than the Western, you know, whatever tradition. And um, it was a problem. So I very much um, hear you about, about that. Um, and I, I don't know that I, again, without knowing what you're listening to, I don't know about commenting on, on infotainment, but I do know that like journalistically music, you know, editorially um, music is not used in the kind of news that we do, but it is, it is a bridging mechanism. And I think you hear it a lot in, in more things that are not broadcast, but are on demand that are, that are narrative um, as a kind of like ornamentation. And I think sometimes it works and I think a lot of times it doesn't work. That's my personal opinion. I'm, before we get to the next question, I'm curious uh, because I feel like there's some shows in particular on NPR where like the second you hear the music, you know what show you're listening to because it's so sort of, uh, it's so sort of clearly associated. Is there like a, is there like a library that, and that you know, the public media has that, uh, like, where do people find this stuff? Where do, where do the writers and the producers find the music that they, oh. that they, that they, that they uh, you know, they end up including? Well, it's a giant, I mean, it depends. If it's a news organization like, a, like NPR, they have an enormous music library and individual directors used to have CDs. I mean, now they have just like, you know, giant, giant, giant playlists. Um, and um, if you are a broadcast organization, like this goes for TV as well, you pay royalties on that music. Um, so if you want to, and even then it's like very tightly controlled and it's extremely expensive. You pay, you know, ASCAP royalties and it's like fees. And if you don't say everything that you've played and you play it and you don't, you know, log it, it's like a big issue. Um, and so if you're making something on your own and you want to like, you know, use Beatles or something or some released music, it's, you know, it's a copyright infringement and it's a big deal. So there is also a lot of you know, on Creative Commons or elsewhere, um, you'll find a lot of music that's like quote unquote royalty free um, that you can use or that people can use or people most often pay to have compose original music for stuff mm -hmm. they do. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, This American Life does that. They use a lot of, I mean, they use music that's already published but they commission a lot of music too. All right, I think that is uh, the the sum total of all the questions we've received. Thank you for uh, moving through all those. Any uh, last thought you want to share before we wrap up? Any sound bite, for lack of a better term? Sound bite, I know, there? right? Um, I, I don't know. Like, I mean, I I just want to say, I mean, I take enormous satisfaction um, in this work. Um, you know, I I really. Like when I was in first grade, we had this great librarian at my public school in Cambridge who would read to us. Um, and I remember like sitting on the carpet and being read to. And, I, and I, I think if you're really lucky, you know, that's almost a universal memory of being read to. Um, 
But um, I just remember relaxing and feeling like totally absorbed and this feeling of well being. Like I just really enjoyed those times. And I think, you know, I recognize that feeling when I'm listening to something that is well produced or if I'm really enmeshed in tape or like writing something. I mean, writing is hard. I've tried to do my own writing too and like, you know, writing my own stories and like it's, it's not easy and everything they say about it. I mean, a lot of people here, you know, writers or tried to write things. It's just, there is kind of a, like, it doesn't just happen, right? Like there's a, there's a craft about it, but I, I take a lot of comfort in the, like, I felt that way and certain stories made me feel that way. And I want to keep feeling that way. And I also want to write stories that like, what's the secret sauce that kind of makes a story worth telling and worth hearing and, reading and like when you get just really absorbed you know that's it's just a great state I think it's one of the great you know parts of being a person <laughs> this is you know that we can take comfort from the written word or the spoken word and um so I I like what I do thank you very much Diantha and thank you David for joining us as well Thank you everyone for, for logging on. Uh, this is the end of this year's uh, Merrill series conversation, but we, we look forward to seeing you again, either at school or on a Zoom event soon and uh, at next year's Merrill series conversation. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Hey, everyone, thanks so much for being here.